Hello, my name is uh, Paul Gilbert, president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And today, this I'm delighted to introduce Graham Music uh, to our Creating a Compassionate World series of interviews. Now, I'm going to read um, Graham's biography because it's a pretty fantastic biography. So Graham um, is a psychotherapist, trainer and author. He has been an adult psychotherapist for over 30 years and currently a consultant child and adolescent psychotherapist at the Tavistock Clinic, where he has worked for over 20 years. He was formerly Associate Clinical Director at the Tavistock Clinic's Child and Family Department. He has developed many innovative programs, including setting up services in over 40 schools and a range of services working with the aftermath of child maltreatment and neglect. His clinical speciality for decades has been understanding and working with trauma he supervises and teaches nationally and internationally and has a particular interest in linking cutting edge developmental research findings with therapeutic practice. His publications include Affect and Function 2001, The Good Life in 2014, Nurturing Natures 2016 and 2010, Nurturing Children from Trauma to Hope, and with Nathan Sinisterberg, he, in, he edited a book for, called From Trauma to Harming Ad Others, Therapeutic Work with Delinquent, Violent, and Sexually Harmful Children and Young People. His new book, which is terrific, is called Respark, and this focuses on igniting hope and joy after trauma, particularly for children who are somewhat flat in affect and find it difficult to explore or to play. So Graham, what a delight to have you talking with us today and I've known you for a few years and I've really been stunned at the amount that you've done in this area and I, I came into this uh, first with the book The Good Life <clears throat> it was an amazing book really looking at so many of the processes that go into making a meaningful life a caring life and a value life so I wonder if I could ask you so how did you get interested in actually working in this area of linking childhood backgrounds with compassionate behavior and well-being? Goodness, well, I mean, where do you start? Maybe my infancy or you think about professional <laughs> <laughs> moments when I developed an interest in this stuff. I think for a long, long time, I realized that early, and I know, for, of course, I knew from my own early experience, and I had a long history of being in therapy and having psychotherapy and being around people who were interested in that area. So, and one of my earliest experiences was learning how to be, do a particular form of play therapy, which would not be allowed today, because it took place in a woman called Rachel Pinney's council flat in, in the 1980s. And there was no um, CRBs, there was no checks or anything like that. You, but you were trained very carefully in watching and being with and being open to the experience of the child. And these children came from complex backgrounds. And what was fascinating was you had to just stay with them, be aware of their thoughts and feelings, not act, not interpret, not give advice. And it was extraordinary to me, two things. One, what came up in us in the presence of a child often doing quite horrendous things in their play, for example, or, sh or showing really quite profound affect and the results of trauma or being quite dead and cut off or whatever. These things all evoked a lot in us, but we could do nothing with that other than bear it. And I felt that was a really important lesson, but maybe the most important lesson was that the extent to which we could be open to the experience of the other, something shifted and changed in the children. And it was almost like a mini miracle. And if I was in charge of training therapists, I think I would make them start by doing something like this, where you would just try to be as present as you can to the other person's psychological and emotional reality in the moment. You know, this is one of the people who influenced me very early on. Actually, two people were um, philosophers, really. One was Martin Buber, of course, I thou, I dare. And the other was Emmanuel Levinas, who's absolute genius if only one could understand him because he's so incomprehensible and complex to understand 
But there's something about his idea of face to face and the what the other evokes in us in terms of the wish to be with them and for them. And so that all started really, really early on. I'm not really answering your question, am I? But then I began to realize the impact when I began to study this stuff, I began to realize the profound, powerful impacts of early experiences and how they show themselves in behaviors, in unconscious, in the unconscious world, in, for example, ch in children's play, in the dreams of adults. And it became clear to me that we had to, first of all, that I wanted to try to see if I could make a difference at a much earlier age. So I initially trained as an adult psychotherapist, but I realized that I wanted to start working with people much younger, but also there was a selfish aspect to that um, train of knowledge gaining and education for me, because I then had the opportunity to study babies, to study infants, to study children, and to study the science around it. And so, I was utterly blown away when I first came across, for example, John Bowlby's work and attachment theory. And I'm proud actually to be in the Tavistock where Bowlby developed his ideas, but also feel slightly ashamed that his ideas weren't really um, given the respectability and credibility that they really deserved and that they get in the outside world. Um, so I, I might be slightly sidetracking the question so make so keep me on track if, it, if that's helpful but the thing that got me particularly interested in compassion and you reached out to me after I wrote The Good Life and very generously I was completely thrilled and I realized how little I knew about compassion focused therapy at, at that time but the thing that got me really interested in it is that I had worked with children from backgrounds of trauma and abuse and neglect for many many years then I came across this extraordinary research by Michael Tomasello in the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, where he found that these children, once they hit the age of about 15, 16 months, sometimes younger, basically around the same age as they um, can, what's the, the Rouge test, the mirror self-recognition test, yes. about the time they pass that test, as it, as it were, if you use words like pass, they would just want to help adults so an adult will be walking along with an object and pretend to drop it and pretend to look around for it and most of these toddlers would go and pick the thing up and give it to the actor it's basically an actor or a researcher and or you could they could be trying to open a door not managing because they've got their handful of books and the toddlers would come along and open the door and then look up at the adult with glee and pleasure and it they would do it time and time again. And I thought, God, this is amazing. Really, really early altruism. But then I thought, bloody, excuse my language. I thought, well, I don't think most of the kids that I work with in, I was currently, I was at that time working in the Tavistock fostering and adoption and kinship care team, where we work with really severely traumatized kids. And I thought, actually, the kids I work with, they wouldn't do that. You know, they probably just wouldn't bother picking up. In fact, if they saw somebody dropping something, they might kick it away and smirk, you know, because they had the trauma had given rise to um, a shutting down of altruistic and compassionate tendencies. And I couldn't put those two things together. In fact, I did write to Michael Tomasello about this. And I still think that actually the research that needs to be done is linking um, some of these altruistic tendencies with possibly attachment styles or other measures that could be done because I'm, I am utterly convinced that um, trauma and stress lowers capacities for, lowers compassionate activity in the brain, in the body, in the nervous system, all of, in all of those areas. And of course we know this, I'm actually, you know, I, I currently work at the Portman Clinic where we work with forensic cases, where we work with abused and traumatized adults who also become perpetrators you never see any of these people coming from a background where there hasn't been serious really serious often abuse and trauma so something gets knocked out of them got gets knocked out of their systems which is an utter tragedy and so what we know is the prison systems are full up of people who have been 
multiply traumatized, you know, developmental trauma, early trauma often, and, um, and the worst perpetrators, the worst crimes tend to be committed by people who've had the worst early experiences, experiences that we can barely, if you think about compassion, that we can barely bear to even think about sometimes. You know, I hear stories and I think I have to all, I have to sort of take a really deep breath just to allow myself to hear the stories that I'm told sometimes of these people who've done these horrendous things. So, so, the, so putting those things together and thinking about, well, how can I remain compassionate to these people who do things that I find pretty unthinkable, but also the fact that actually they were born with this, with a capacity for altruism, compassion, security, ease, that they lost really, really early on. And so I think a lot of my life's work has been in trying to put those things together and find ways of working with people which allow them to find some, I suppose, in a sense that actually life doesn't have to be the way their whole being has learned it, it should be up until now. So in a way, it's a similar path, I guess, to you from different directions, but a similar path. It's that's terrific. I mean, you and I have talked about this on a number of occasions because both of us really are evolutionists. We want to understand the nature of the brain through evolutionary processes. And we know that um, attachment in primates and also other mammals, and to some degree, avian species, is absolutely fundamental in how it stimulates subsequent maturation of the brain and the body. I think what's also really interesting is the fact that humans uh, followed a trajectory about maybe two million years ago, something like that, where they became hunters and gatherers. And in those societies and those groups, caring and sharing was absolutely crucial. And that trajectory is interesting because um, a lot of primates, as they become older, they have to compete for social position. <clears throat> and most status hierarchies in primates are regulated through threat. The whole point of what the dominant does is to threaten the subordinate, and they'll only feel safe if the subordinate shows that they're frightened. And you get that, as you say, in prisons a lot, that a lot of these people will only feel safe if they know they can frighten you or they have the capacity to harm you or injure you, then they feel safe. They cannot feel safe in any other way in the way that people with secure attachments certainly can. And the point that you make, I think, is such a brilliant point, which is that what's happened is that when you grow in environments of threat, that you are automatically geared like, you know, like a train being geared onto a new track to, to orientate yourself towards threat and defense and then you get all the stuff and then when it gets very serious people become interested in sadism because that's the extreme form of feeling safe because i can really hurt you so now i feel okay i feel powerful i feel strong so what you're doing i think is terrific because what you're doing is you're trying to reactivate these relatively new evolutionary mechanisms in the brain for empathy, the frontal cortex and all that, which turns that down and creates a very different type of social interest, which is the social interest to be empathically caring. And that switch is really tricky. And I think a lot of the work that you have been doing, highlighting the fact that as therapists, we have to be able to hold that strategy they're using which is the fear you know the, the fear-based strategy if i can induce fear in you i don't have to be frightened and unfortunately we've got enough leaders around the world who are a bit like yeah. that um that actually i can change this into being i can be interested in you i can be interested in caring for you we can actually create a mutually supportive connectedness between us which will then regulate our vagus regulate our oxytocin regulate our frontal cortex and all that so the key point you're making, I think, is that in order to do that, the first thing is, as therapists, we have to bear their strategies and recognize they're not chosen. These are evolved strategies uh, which have become overactivated because of trauma. And that ability to bear the stories of rape and harm and sadism and so forth, it's such an important point you make. But so the question I would ask you is, how do you do that then? Because some of the things you hear are just you know, awful, awful, like, you know, in, in veterans and things. Yeah, well, I think in part it becomes, it comes from getting older, <laughs> but I think, <laughs> and seeing more, and I suppose being more and more aware of what I might, I might have been capable of in another life. Your shadow self. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, people like Robert Bly and all the unions have always talked about this in, a, in an utterly brilliant way. And knowing, you know, I know very deeply myself, sadly, just when I'm under stress, um, I'm not the nicest person in the world. You know, like none of us are. And when I feel danger, you know, there's no point in being empathic and trying to mentalize when somebody's coming at you with a knife or a tiger's coming to bite your head off, you know, that's the point where you go into survival mode. And so, of course, you know, I completely agree with what you're saying about our evolutionary origins, in which mostly in these smaller groups, and again, there's some controversy about the environment of evolutionary adaptedness. You know, some people are now, David Graeber and people are arguing that actually we might have a heritage which included large groups as well, interestingly, but primarily in smaller groups, you needed to show trust, generosity, a degree of theory of mind, empathy, mentalizing in order to survive. And if you stepped out of line and became too individualistic and self-interested, you got cut down and you got ostracized and then you were out of the community. And there's good reason why the brain pathways involved in, in ostracism are very similar to the brain pathways in physical pain because bloody hell, you are at risk of serious, or probably at risk of pretty imminent death if you get ostracized from a small hunter-gatherer group and you're, you're a lone wolf. So, um, so given that, and, and just going back to something you said a moment ago before, I agree with you about primates, I agree with you about attachment, although I think there are primates that don't solve these problems with aggression only. You know, bonobos solve it by having a lot of sex, but they're um, matrilineal. <laughs> They're a, they're a matrilineal species. They're a bit different, I think, in, in some ways. Um, one of the things that the people I work with struggle with as well, of course, is that they struggle with something which starts as defensive, like I got hurt and I go home and hurt somebody. So I'm projecting getting rid of my feeling. Um, can become pleasurable in its own right. So that whole system around addiction and dopaminergic systems can mean that the thing that you start doing in order to feel powerful then becomes enjoyable in its own right. So it becomes what we might think of as a, of a secondary defense. And I think that makes it much, much more complicated to work with. So going back to your question, which I haven't forgotten, is um what do you do well of course people who come to see us often have a background of trauma they might it might be domestic violence or it might be the opposite it might be high levels of neglect and so trying to make sense of how they're interpreting the world is really really important so and it might be if somebody comes from a background of high levels of violence that well, what we know, of course, from the brain research is that if you come from a background where there's lots of domestic abuse and violence, then parts of the brain involved in threat are much, much more activated at moments when most of us don't have that activation. Whereas if you come from a background of high levels of neglect, those areas of the brain involved in threat are barely activated, but there's a kind of coldness. So A, we have to understand who is this person in front of us, how are they interpreting and experiencing the world? Because it's probably very different to how we're experiencing the world in that way that Carl Friston describes in terms of the brain as a predictive mechanism. And I quite often, so, so going back to what I described with this wonderful, if crazy woman, Rachel Pinney in the play therapy all those years ago, staying with where somebody is, is really important. But when they get a bit more grown up, you have to actually show them that you know where they're coming from. And that in itself gives rise to safeness, I think. So yeah, I think if I was brought up where my mum and dad were slamming in doors and shouting at each other and kicking each other all the time, then when I heard, I might jump like you did just then, when I heard that door slamming down the road, that, you know, down the corridor. Let's take a bit of a deep breath here and calm down or, um, if I was born in an orphanage like you were, when nobody picked me up, I think I wouldn't notice if somebody was smiling at me. 
or somebody was angry. You know, so you're starting from those places and trying to make sense of what we might think, what people used to think of as, as defences. But I think we would think of as adaptations. Yes. That these are absolutely brilliant strategies in environment A, but we're now in environment B and they don't work so well. They don't work so well in primary school or nursery. For example, if you're being hypervigilant and jumpy and can't sit still and concentrate, then that isn't very, very helpful. So finding a way of helping them be with themselves in a way which is understandable and must always be the starting point. So where I absolutely, what I, one of the things I absolutely love about compassion focused therapy is that focus on initial safening, which I think does come from being understood and being soothed in relationship. And one of the interesting things, of course, that's different between primates and other primates and humans is that we are, we do have an attachment system, which is really fundamental and powerful, although there's big arguments about whether or not we've kind of attachment theory in itself is too culturally um, biased, but that's a whole other story. Let's leave that aside. Um, but we, we are a caught what, Sarah Hurdy calls, of course, a, a, a cooperative breeding species, which means that we rear our children in groups, one thing Bob, we actually did get wrong, and that we need a range of adults. And in order to, we tend to be reared by a range of adults as opposed to chimpanzees and other primates, which means you have to understand other, how other people think and feel to work out, are they safe? Are they showing love? Are they showing disapproval? Which means, that the capacity to mentalize, to think about other minds, to understand what somebody else is thinking, feeling, and also to understand our own, and make a relationship between those things, really, really crucial, which I think is why it's at the point when you, when these kids, so for those of the, who don't know who are listening, the, the mirror self-recognition test is when you put a bit of rouge on somebody's face, baby, and they put them in front of the mirror. And if they can touch, if they touch their own face at that point, you know, there's a degree of mirror self-recognition. And those are the kids in nurseries that have been found to be the ones who reach out and help other children when they're in distress. Whereas if they haven't passed that, interestingly, they, they are rarely the ones who reach out and help. So it's very linked to attachment status and attachment style. So I'm sort of sticking with your question a bit and, and digressing a bit, which is, um, and you're very welcome to keep me on track. But I think step one is always safening in therapeutic work. It's always giving them an experience and it has to be an experience in somebody's nervous system. However, however we get there, and it might be through interpretation, it might be through breathing exercises, it might be through a safe space, it might be through some kind of imagination, but you, we can't do therapeutic work until somebody feels safe. Yes, I agree entirely with that. And I, <clears throat> I loved your point about bonobos because bonobos are very interesting because they turned sexual behavior into um, a cooperative um, and form of communication and bonding, whereas in many primates, of course, sexual behavior is competitive. Mm. Uh, so that's a very interesting switch that happened. We don't quite know how that happened. But also, as you say, Sarah Hardy is, Hardy is this really important point that no primate will allow another primate to touch their baby, not until the baby is about three months old. Whereas in humans, partly because of the change to the birth canal and the difficulty mm -hmm. in birthing and all that, uh, which makes human birthing one of the most painful and difficult, um, females have needed to have cooperative helpers around. So babies are actually shared around very early on to the relatives, the aunts and, the, and so on, grandparents and so on. <clears throat> and that does seem to be quite important. And what you call hello parenting, where actually the whole community is responsible for the well-being and uh, and the child and the importance of play you know you probably know a lot of the recent work on play how play is so important within these communities and a lot of the older individuals with these kids they play with them play with them play with them play with them, smile at them and, and and so on and so on creating as you say this general sense of safeness which is constantly down regulating threat processing all the time um so i think that's absolutely fundamental but if you tragically get born into a situation where the opposite is happening, your threat system is being overstimulated, then you, you, you do get into trouble. Uh, but, and, and I think you're right, you know, Bowlby was correct in talking about secure base, proximity seeking, safe haven. I think those were brilliant observations, but 
not that any one person could do it. Yeah, Actually, absolutely. They're community-based. And as we become into adolescence, they become peer-based. We all want to belong to groups and blah, blah, blah. So that's absolutely true. But I want to come back to the question about that you, you make, because when we're as therapists and when we're working in the prisons, one of the most important thing is to help therapists and indeed prison officers tolerate the harmfulness in the other and not to shame it, not to project it into the bad, you know, you're bad, I'm good, and I, you know, you're just a nasty person and blah, 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 blah. Because that, as you know, from the prisons, that's one of the big challenges we've got that the, trying to get the professionals to see that these individuals have got tricky brains, you know, they're, they're not just bad individuals, they're individuals who are being programmed, if I can use that word, to orientate themselves to a threat-based world. And in a threat-based world, you either go down or you go up. Mm. In the prisons, you find the people who have chosen that one in our depressed clinics, which is the ones that have gone down. So, um, but again, the question I ask you is, so how do you bear it? You know, when somebody talks to you about, you know, raping somebody and, and that they get excitement from seeing how frightened that person is while they're doing it. I mean, how do you bear that kind of... Okay, so I, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think the more we can bear our own potential evil, if you like, if you can use those words, and what we might be capable of, and all of our thoughts and fantasies, and the more we can be open to um, the emotional reality of another, then we've got a much better chance of staying with them because we, we've got a better chance of staying with ourselves. And one of the interesting things about, for example, doing infant observation or that good old play therapy with Rachel Pinney was that because you couldn't do anything else, you couldn't give advice or have a chat or tell people what to do or anything like that. You just had to stay with sometimes the most horrendous looking play of killing and killing and killing and killing, you know, that kind of thing. And Personally, I've been helped by having my own personal practice for, you know, on and off for at least two thirds of my life. I've had some kind of meditation practice of different kinds and breathing practice and physical practice of some kind as well. Yoga or going to the gym, running, whatever it is. But actually, I think probably the being able to be with whatever's present has been the most helpful thing. And I remember sort of, I hate to say this, but probably about 40 years ago, I used to go to a Buddhist center in East London that some people would know. And on one day they had an ordinary breath meditation. And on the second day, they always had a metabhavna sort of compassion type of meditation. I hated the compassion meditation. I always only, always avoided that day of the week and only went to the breath meditation oh, yeah, yeah. because I thought it was like saccharine and I thought it was, um, but actually as I, over the years, I managed to learn how to, learn how to appreciate those states of yeah. Okay, so as over the years, I managed to learn how to open up to whatever in the other person, then I think that really helped me as well as learning how to be with it in myself. Of course, I'm a million miles away from it in most of my life, but nonetheless, that is the aspiration. I always remember, so do you remember the spiritual teacher Ramdas, who died a couple of years ago? Um, Ramdas, of course, is like one of these, yeah, um, anyway, he was a kind of great icon of the Buddhist world, despite, and, and being many of the Buddhist of Jewish origin, I think there's a whole, they call them Bujus, there's, um, and I probably fit that category <laughs> in some ways. But one of the things he did is he had a shrine, even after his stroke, when he was living in wherever it was, Mexico, Hawaii, he had a shrine and he would put on his shrine, not the Buddha, or, you know, like therapists have Freud or whoever, Jung or whoever, he would have the people he struggled to reach out to. So he would have Putin, he, today he would have Putin, he had Donald Trump, you know, those are the people he put on his shrine <laughs> in order to try to be able to open up to and show compassion for these people who most of us just want to hate. And that isn't to say that he wouldn't stand up for social justice and stand up against things that we don't approve of. And getting that balance right, I think is quite a complicated one, but we have to be able to bear how somebody else is. Otherwise, we can't really help them. And, and, and in prisons, of course, what you see a lot of is projection. So the guards are very 
grateful that they're the good ones and and the others are the bad ones we know how quickly that can shift we know from the old i know it's been critiqued a bit but the stanford prison experiments how easy it is to move from one position prisoner to guard etc and but one of the so actually here at the Paul clinic we do a lot of training of probation officers and i supervise people who run prison wards for quite a few years and one of the important things about that work is helping the staff learn how to be compassionate towards and think about and process and bear the worlds of these prisoners who are doing horrendous things and when they're doing horrendous things which include sexual things to children it's really hard to bear but if they could be open to and try to make sense of and bear that somehow something shifts in them and in the and in the prisoners and they feel listened to and they feel heard and there's the possibility of work if we make them all bad and us all good we know that's recipe for disaster we know that simple splitting and projection that's always going to come back to haunt us yes that's such an important point because it's the issue of shaming and so on which as you know is really quite important for us but um i, I think those are such key key themes that you're mentoning that the ability to bear i mean one of the exercises we use is to say look imagine that you you have a brother that you love right you got a brother yeah. but then they get infected by the zombie virus and if they get close to you they will kill you and they will infect you how are you going what are you going to do how are you doing so the idea is to actually that you you know with some individuals you do need to look after yourself and keep yourself safe mm -hmm. you hate them you have to actually understand that these individuals have been literally infected and basically a lot of the people that we're working with have not been infected but they've had their brains literally damaged i mean they we have to understand that now those yep. brains have not actually had the opportunity to evolve in the way that they should have been allowed to mature they have you know so all, all that stuff so we're dealing with quote damaged brains or at least brains that have been patterned in a certain kind of way one of the questions i'd like to ask you which is a, a really tricky one i think which I struggle with as well, is I think that the attachment structure, early life experiences are, are really fundamental to understanding these processes. But let's go to, if you think about Ukraine or something like that, and in war situations from, you know, what, five, 10,000 years when we go to war, we do the most horrific things. And mm -hmm. you guys haven't been in traumatized attachment relationships. The role of context in facilitating hostility is cruelty i mean the romans were i mean i'm very interested in roman society because it's mm. such a cruel society you know with its crucifixions and games and everything mm. I mean, what's your take on cultural and contextual uh, effects on violence and sadism and and harmfulness okay big questions actually i think it goes back much further and hunter gatherer groups often raided other groups and killed the you know the males would kill the other males so it's it's not only since um since more kind of pastoral and urban societies yet context is everything okay so how i see it is very simple in some ways which is first of all there are these biological mechanisms that we all have in us we all have the same things as say a cat has which is that we can react when we're being attacked, but also we can have the capacity to hunt in a cold, callous way and not care about our prey. And so there's a kind of dehumanization that must, must be there for really good evolutionary reasons. So, but it has terrible, terrible costs. And so the context is absolutely everything, as you say. You know, th there's no question that that neo-Nazi movements, right-wing movements, those sorts of things occur much more when there's when the environment is threatening at times of economic downturn. You know, it's no coincidence Hitler came to power when he did. It's, these things are not a coincidence. And it, we can make sense of it in terms of how we understand nervous systems, but also large group and small group dynamics as well. And we, because we're such a group species, we um we have these unfortunate propensities which have arose for really good reasons to do with for wanting to be in an in-group and there being an out group who aren't us and obviously that happens much more when the, when we're under threat and so the other 
becomes less than human, you know. And so it, whether it's the Hutsis and Tutsis, whether it's um, Russians, Russians in Ukraine, whether it's the Nazis, there's that process of dehumanization. And that it requires huge, huge courage, but also something else which I think is a bit intangible to be able to stand outside that group process and trust something inside which says, this doesn't quite feel right. This, this, I'm, I don't want to go along with this. Again, am I digressing here, Paul? Or is this kind of somewhere near the question? No, that's right. I mean, the point is that we, you know, we, Putin has seen a terrible hatred, of course, in Ukraine. And that's been going on for those sorts of things have been happening for thousands of years in our wars and tribal wars. I mean, Genghis Khan, I mean, <laughs> Hitler, there, there's so many of them, Stalin, there's so many of these leaders that get, get to power and then stimulate the dark side in us, even from mm. who've got secure backgrounds and so forth. So, I mean, what I'm interested in, and you know, we've talked about this, is that what about if you have a secure background and yet still you end up in the May Line massacre or the Nanking massacre or whatever it is? Um, <clears throat> uh, in Budapest, there are these awful um, museums to the testament of what the Russians did in Hungary and so on. So, because the question is creating a compassionate world, but even if we create secure attachments for people, that's not necessarily going to guarantee that we can move the world to a more compassionate place if we still constantly support leaders that are actually terribly destructive. And what's slightly say slightly it's very worried to be very worried to me is how our entertainment has over the last 20 years become increasingly sadistic increasingly male on male violence increasingly the good guys getting their vengeance on the bad guys you know game of thrones all these things so there's something is happening in the west that amongst all of our wealth and resources we're actually becoming a more sadistic uh, uncaring society as well as a caring society <clears throat> and so the question is how can your all of your wisdoms and your experience about how people turn you know to, into doing horrible things it, what what can we use of your knowledge to think about what do we need to do in our schools and our businesses uh, to kind of bring about the fact that we're very easily turned to the dark side i mean <laughs> it's star wars again isn't it beware the power of the dark side but it's true no it's utterly true and again mm -hmm. leaving so we've already talked about the fact that we have to embrace, not embrace in a loving way, but embrace, well, in a way, know our own dark side and, this, and, and, and have respect for the power of the dark side yeah, yeah, and try yeah. to find, try to believe that something else out there. I think what we do in what I've been talking about doing with prison, you know, managers of wings of prisons or going into schools where you see, you can see very, very similar things, which is that often there's children who get referred for therapy because they're misbehaving. And then in some schools, what you find is there's always, there's a kid who's like the bad kid and everything will be fine if we could only find a way of excluding this kid. And guess what? You exclude the kid and another kid pops up. Oh, there's another bad one. Let's get rid of this bad apple. But actually it's the culture, which is a culture of harshness and inability to reflect on and think about the children the effect they have on us, what they stir up in us, like prisoners, what do they stir up in us? Because they're getting under our skins all the time. The, and so if you, can, if you can create a culture of caring and of interest and of tolerating difficult emotional states, that makes a huge difference. And that is that goes right from levels of the family, the nuclear family, the extended family, the community, the village, um schools right up to the macro level and one of the really difficult things we have of course is that um is that well first of two things really one is that this is awful propensity for splitting so of course you know we're, i think most of us are a bit terrified of the kind of cold callous what seemingly psychopathic um states of mind that we see in people like Putin, but we are then very quick. We find it much harder to think that anybody in Ukraine might ever have anything bad about them, or you know that there were some, these new these neo-Nazi regiments, or that there's um, racism, so that actually the black people struggled 
to be allowed out or in. And, you know, so, so actually the splitting that goes on, and we saw this in COVID between the pro-vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers, we're living in an increasingly divisive world. And social media whips that up because actually we look much more when there's arguments. And so all the algorithms are geared to whipping up conflict. Um, but in all that, for me, the overarching thing is that we're living in, and we have been living in an increasingly neoliberal, individualistic yeah, yeah. world, yeah, yeah. which has got more and more like that over the last 30, 40, 50 years. It's easy to forget that in United States of America, I think the tax rates, for example, post-war was something like 70 or 80%, you know, mm -hmm. you forget, or even higher. And what we know is inequality has a very, very profound, powerful effect, not just on health outcomes and on mental health outcomes, but on stress, trust, capacity to be generous, all of those sorts of things. And so I see that kind of hyper individualism, which was always a potential, even within small hunter gatherer communities, but actually they weren't allowed to get away with it. So there was so much, and we might think about it as too much social control, but there was so much social co um, enforced almost social cohesion and adherence to group values which meant that you couldn't be a kind of a raging psychopath and get away with it because you would get thrown out. And that is no longer the case. Now we valorize the strong ones, the rich ones, the powerful ones, the ones who look good. And so we've got a real challenge to try to challenge the, the political systems and the economic systems at a macro level, as well as, as, as well as at a micro level, at the level of the individual and the family. And this requires quite a lot of courage, I think, as well as, because we can't do it ourselves, you and me can't do it, but if we can be part of a movement that can be moving in that direction, one in which there is compassion and empathy and care and a desire to reach out to other people and not just believe that the world is a dog eat dog, eat dog world, then that's what might give us some hope, I think. Yes, I can completely agree with you and I love this point that you keep coming back to the ability to tolerate one's own dark side because there's a famous story by the Dalai Lama one of his uh, monks was captured by the Chinese and tortured and um, when he was released and he went to um, meet the Dalai Lama the Dalai Lama said were you you know were you ever frightened or in danger and he said yes I was in danger of losing my compassion for my torturers brilliant yeah because the key thing is right if their dark side stirs up yours, you're lost. And what you're saying is that in order for that not to happen, so in other words, we can actually respond to the dark side with intelligence, with empathy, with understanding, and a scientific way of thinking of how we're going to calm this down, then we have a chance. But if we just meet vengeance with vengeance or anger with anger or rage with rage, shame with shame, then we really are just chasing our tails. So this point that you're talking about, the, the ability to tolerate the dark side that we're all created by our DNA, none, none of us chose to be here, we've all got these things, um, uh, is fundamental, I think, for people, because as you say, it's that tendency to split, you know, the, the bad is in them and the good is in me. Yes. Uh, it's so fundamental, I think, so fundamental. Um, and also the point that you make about neoliberalism, because, you know, in our position, there are two, you know, there are more than two, but the two big ones are competitiveness and care and share, control and hold versus control and share. And uh, as you say, after the war, because we were in nest building reparation, that was the psychology after the war, we had high tax rates. I think in this country it was some something like 80 or 90 percent. Mm. But then we built the health service, we built rail service, we built universities and so on. And it was only with the neoliberal in the 80s with Thatcher and Reagan and that rather those rather callous individuals, in my view, started to chip away, chip away, chip away. And also the unions actually were pretty callous as well. They want just give me more of the pie, more of the pie, instead of working for a cooperative. Um, you know, we had Beck, uh, the um, against strife and all that stuff. So we have to also, I think, as therapists, think about how are we going to think about how we can move things, political discussions, into cooperative relating to talk about you know doing things together whether it's about you know working with europe or the rest of the world or in our communities actually the 
solutions to the world problems are, are caring cooperation. Yeah. Because and we need to start by putting our own houses in order. We do. We do. You know, for example, in my world, I mean, you know, the Kleinians don't talk to the Winnicottians, don't talk to the Anafreudians, don't talk to the Jungians, you know, you know. Um, I'm sure you've got the similar rivalries between CFT and ACT and different forms of cognitive therapies and a whole range of different things. And we're, we're trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And so we have to be interested and curious and open to difference. And that's a really, really difficult thing. And the other thing I want to say, Paul, is there's something about courage, because you did ask about that early on. Yeah. And I think, you know, so we have to be able to stand up against what we think of as injustice. Yeah. It does require courage. It shouldn't be fueled by hatred. It's very hard. And I think some of that can also take place in the consulting room. And one of my fears about what's happened in the world of working with trauma over the last few years is that we've got brilliant understanding the importance of safeness we've somehow possibly lost sight a bit of the fact that actually people develop defenses which might which they um which we cling to because it's too scary to give them up because that means facing emotional pain anger rage that kind of stuff and so as therapists i think we also need to show a bit more courage to stand up against the defenses in our clients and I think it's a similar kind of courage that we need to stand up against things that we don't like in the world. So courage is underrated. I agree I entirely. I agree <laughs> entirely. The courage and wisdom, you know, we, we highlight this in the CFT, you know, if you're a firefighter going to save somebody in a burning house, I mean, you're not in the soothing grounding. You know, <sighs> compassion has been over identified with soothing and grounding. Maybe it's part of our you know we may contribute to that but actually the key is the courage and wisdom to address suffering wherever you see it that's it and sometimes that does require quite significant courage you know physical mm. but also mental courage emotional courage uh, and again come back to your key point is that the beginning of emotional courage is, comes with facing one's own dark side and not projecting it onto the other and therefore being able to tolerate what's happened to them because they didn't choose that. They didn't wake up when they were four years old and said, you know what, I could be a surgeon, I could be a Buddhist monk, but how oh, that's boring, I'm going to be a psychopath. Nobody chooses this stuff. Okay, we all just find ourselves stuck with the brain that's doing this. So all of that stuff about mindfulness and, and meditations and harnessing and practicing compassion is such an important point. So the, as we're beginning to come to the end now, um, thank you for a wonderful discussion, actually, Graham. How would you like to see your work progress? How, what do you see the future for you and the, the, the quality of the work that you've done? I mean, you've got this fabulous book um, called ReSpark, which I think is terrific. Everybody should read that, uh, particularly we're working with neglected children. But how would you like to see your work develop and take off? Well, I'd like not to see it too clearly in some ways. <laughs> Partly as, get, as we're getting older, um, it's very easy to get a bit calcified, I think, and rigid and stuck in our ways. And you mentioned play early, earlier on. Yeah. And I've long, long, long been passionate about the importance of play. And of course, you can't play unless you feel safe enough to play. Yeah. So the play system gets trumped by the fear system, by the stress system, by all of those other things. And for me, I, I'm not quite sure, but you know, if I was younger, I might have gone in a completely or well, similar directions, but I might have added a whole range of different things in to do with understanding health from a physiological level, understanding the body in a different kind of way. Um, so I don't know where my work is going to go, but I'm fairly sure that it, that it will include an increased interest in working with how trauma and neglect and other things get embedded in our cells and in our bodies and finding ways of unlocking some of those patterns that aren't very helpful, including in myself. Um, so I think in some ways it will be, well, it's a bit of a shock really because, so I, I just looked at something that, um, that I wrote 20 years ago called Affect and Emotion. And when I, and I read it, because I thought, I've, I'm just going to change it a bit and then republish it. And what shocked me was 
a lot of the themes that I was writing about then are the themes that I'm still writing and thinking about, which worried me a little bit, because actually what I want is to be able to develop new interests and bring new things together and continue to be curious and whatever comes around the corner, wow. And I hope that never, never a day goes by when I don't think, wow, that is so interesting. I must pursue that. And I know that my life will not be long enough, however long it is, to, to pursue all the interests that I've got. But I think, you know, that's the spirit I would like to try to find in myself. And there's loads and loads and loads of areas I'd like to pursue. But, you know, and I know there won't be time for them all. Well, I think you've definitely re-sparked yourself. I mean, you're a man of immense enthusiasm, scholarship, courage, and I say you've written some wonderful books. And I mean, is there any chance of maybe a second edition of The Good Life? Yeah, I think it needs doing, actually. I've got to do a third edition of Nurturing Natures, yeah. and then I might like to make a version of The Good Life, which actually was probably slightly ahead of, ahead of its time in some oh, ways. Very ahead of its time. And so probably got a bit missed, and maybe it needs to be rewritten in a different way, in a bit more ordinary language, and um, a bit less research. I think one of the things that happens as, you get, as I get a bit older is I don't care quite so much about having to justify everything with a research finding and a citation and actually the ideas and need to be able to speak for themselves in a more human way. So yeah, I would like to do that. And last question then, if anybody wants to get involved with some of the work you're doing or find out some about some of your trainings and stuff like that, how, how can they do that? Okay, so I've got a website, um, which I think you might get. Yes, we're going to share, we'll show, yeah, we will. And I also have a newsletter which I tend to send out once a month. And it has sort of things that I find a bit interesting, maybe some books I've read or talks that look interesting or videos or books that, or um, other bits of writing that are interesting. And it'll have news about me as well. And it will have the odd photograph of things that I've enjoyed in the last month. And it also has a very bad joke. So I would really urge people to sign up for my newsletter and then send me some better jokes to put in the newsletter. And hopefully I can give you the link to put on the end of this yes, as well. Yes, we'd be delighted to have the link to put on because the newsletter is full of wonderful little insights. Well, not so little sometimes, but uh, it's a lovely <laughs> newsletter and we would certainly uh, ask people to do that. So um, Graham, Dr. Graham Music, it's been a delight to talk to you, uh, contributing to how we can think about bringing a more compassionate world for our children and grandchildren and you've made a marvellous contribution to those thoughts. Thank you so much, and we look forward to meeting up. Thank you so time. much, Paul. And can I just say, finally, as always, it's been a great pleasure. I'm really, I think the world is needs to be incredibly grateful for all the work that you and the Compassion Mind Foundation is doing and, and has done. And I love talking to you, and my only regret is that we haven't got another three hours and aren't in that pub or that restaurant that we met in last time in Derby because we could go on forever. But thank you so much for asking me to do this. It's been a pleasure and we will uh, arrange a, another meeting shortly. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.